goal today, like I was saying, is to be able to cover all of the parameters of the design rules checking within Eagle. Um, we're going to cover the DRC, and if we have some time, we'll also cover a little bit of the ERC, since that's pretty basic uh, checking. Um, if you guys have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to send them into the chat or through the Q&A. Likewise, any comments, concerns, criticisms, anything like that, also feel free to send them through those means. Um, we're going to go ahead and be sharing my screen in a second so you guys will be able to see uh, what I see. Um, I'm actually going to share it now. Please confirm if you guys can see it. Also, if, if anyone can hear me, I'm going to actually send in a quick uh, verify to Tony so that way he can get onto the webinar. Okay, good. Video and audio is good. Everything looks fine. Okay, cool. So we're going to go ahead and start then. Okay, excellent. So let's go ahead and get started. So what I have here is we're going to first look at the hexapod board, okay? And this is the board that ships, one of the examples that ships with Eagle. And it's going to be a good uh, board just to explore the DRC in its entirety. So the design rules check can be accessed by either clicking on the DRC icon, which is this one here on the bottom left, or by going edit, uh, so, tool, sorry, tools DRC, okay? Now, one thing I want to clarify, some people will continually click on the errors button to try to see errors and things like that. Um, in this case, let me create an error. Let me just uh, short something out real easy. So let's do that. Okay, if we run the DRC, we say check, you're going to see that we have some errors here, okay? Now, some people will see this errors dialog and click it thinking that they're running the DRC again. This icon just shows you the most recent set of errors, okay? And that's in the case that you don't want to keep these up uh, or you want to correct them and this is getting in your way, you can always close this and get the errors back by looking here, okay? Now, you'll notice that you have the error polygons. These basically just show you where an error is. So as, as we provoke errors on purpose, you'll see that Eagle will highlight them using these polygons that you can see here. Okay, they're basically brightly colored areas. They cannot be deleted or removed manually. Okay, there's only one way to get rid of them, and that is to go to the errors and hit this clear all. If you do that, you'll see that they will go away. Okay, if we run the DRC again, then they'll come back because we haven't corrected the error. Okay, so that's just something that it's a little caveat that tends to trip up new users. Um, they run the DRC once, and then they think that every time they hit the errors dialog that they're refreshing. It doesn't refresh. It just shows you what the results of the last run. So even if you corrected this, if I went right now and did a, an undo and put it back, you'll see that the error polygons are still there. And if I click on errors, it's still going to show the errors that were showing up before. Okay. So that's an important caveat of the errors command. And if I run DRC now, we don't get those errors anymore. Okay, so that's just a quick little little aside I wanted to cover before we got started. Now let's go through the parameters of the DRC. The first tab, the file tab, allows you to save the current settings as a DRU file. So if, for example, you tend to work with three or four board houses, um, let's say Osh Park, and you work with dirty PCBs, which are common hobbyist board houses, okay? You can actually adjust the DRC and save those adjustments as a DRU file. So if you know you're going to have a board sent with Osh Park, you just come here, you hit load, and you can go ahead and load the DRU file for Osh Park or for dirty PCBs or whoever you're going to use. Eagle ships with DRU files for various manufacturers, Worth Electronics, Euro Circuits, and Multi-CB. 
Okay, and depending on what service you're using, you can select a specific DRU file. Okay, so this is something, this is the first thing you see, but a lot of people tend to miss it. So if you find yourself needing certain uh, design rules or using those often, you can save them and actually set them up as a default. So let's go now into the Layers tab. Layers tab is very, very important. It is through this tab that you set up a multi-layer board. Okay, so if you need four, six, eight, all 16 layers, you set that up here through the Layers tab. Okay? Now, you'll notice that by default it's set to 1 times 16. Okay, and what a lot of people will do if they need a four layer board is they'll go one, two, three, four. That's not correct. The way Eagle expects the layers to be defined is working from the outside surfaces towards the middle. Okay, so let's say we wanted a four layer board. We might do one times two times 15 times 16. That would be the correct configuration or the canonical. You know, that's what we would consider correct. One, two, three may work if you have a uh, standard and if you have a a pro license for sure to work but it's not the best way to do it okay if you were working on the third file one two three wouldn't work it would actually require you to do 15 and if you had a six layer board you would have to do three times 14 times 15 times 16 for a six layer board if you do one two three four five and 16 or one two three four five and six you'll notice that the standard and the hobbyist versions will not accept that because the correct uh, form as Eagle defines it is working from the outside surfaces towards the center. Okay, So that's a key point to remember when you're adding additional layers. You always want to work from the outside surfaces towards the middle. Now you'll also notice um, here that besides this asterisk character we could use a plus. Right, I could also do pluses on all of these, and they would also work. So what distinction does Eagle make between the plus and the asterisk? So the plus represents a material known as prepreg. Okay? It is basically FR4 material with only copper on one side. The asterisk represents core material, which is, again, FR4 material but it has copper on both sides. And the idea behind this is to kind of simulate how the board really is manufactured. So in the case, let's go back to our case of a four-layer board. Officially, or again, the canonically correct way, is that the manufacturer will take a piece of core material, which is copper clad board on both sides. They'll do whatever they have to do on the internal layers. And then they'll place prepreg on either surface. So they take this copper from the core, and then they have the copper from the prepreg here. So because the prepreg only has copper on one side, it doesn't add additional weight here. So basically, you have a uniform copper thickness on all the layers. That's the objective. Now, is it strictly necessary to remember that when setting up your layers here? Not really. The reason being is that this information, this definition of core and prepreg, doesn't make it into the Gerber's. The Gerber file format doesn't carry that info. So your board manufacturer is going to use, unless you specify differently, it's going to, they're going to use whatever, whatever board stack up they normally use anyway. So unless you specify something else, they're going to use a standard board stack up. So this is kind of a mute point. There was a UOP that actually took advantage of this information for uh, RF simulation. Um, but that's the only one. Same thing with this information here. None of these layer thicknesses and copper thickness information, none of that actually makes it into the Gerber. So if you don't fill it out or if you don't adjust it, you don't have to worry. The big concern really is setting up this equation here. You can see also that the pick test, depending on what parameter we're, we're using, and that's a, a common theme throughout the DRC. When in doubt of what a particular parameter may represent, click on it, and usually the picture will adjust to very clearly indicate what that parameter controls. So to not go too crazy here, we are going to cover setting up blind and buried vias. 
So blind vias are vias that can be seen from one of the surfaces, either the top or the bottom, but don't exit out the other side. So a simple example. The way they're set up is using square brackets. And then here we put on the front, we're basically specifying that the blind V is from the top to whatever layer number I'm going to place now. Let's say layer two, colon. And that the, the syntax of it is defined here, OK? Right here. We, that's where the syntax is defined. So you can see that the DRC adjusts now. So we have a blind via that goes from the top to layer two, but doesn't exit out the other side. If I turn layer two into layer 15, you'll see that it's still a blind via. It goes from the top surface down to layer 15. And it crosses layer two. Similarly, I'll leave that at two. Similarly, we can define a blind via from the bottom surface to any higher layer. So over here, we'll put semicolon, and let's say to 15. Okay, so it's going from the bottom surface up to layer 15, or up to layer 2. Okay, that's how that's how blind vias are set up. So the, again, the key point with blind vias is they, they can be seen, they're exposed at one of the outer surfaces, but they don't pop out the other side. Now, when multiple boards come up, sometimes users get the impression that in order to be able to connect any of the layers, they have to do individual connections between layers. So what do I mean by that? So some people get the impression that if they only have a via that goes from 1 to 16, one that goes from 1 to 2, and one that goes from 16 to 15, that they have no way of connecting layers 2 and 15. And that's not the case. You can connect any layer to any other layer with just having the 1 to 16 via. This one via can connect any layer to any other layer. What will happen is it will connect to the layers it's supposed to and isolate from any layers it isn't supposed to connect to. It automatically handles that. So at a bare minimum, you only need the via that can touch all the layers. As long as it can reach all the layers, this is good enough. It's also your cheapest option when getting boards made. You'll find that many of the hobbyist services actually don't do blind or buried vias because they're an, an additional manufacturing cost because they're made when the prepreg is on its own. So instead of being able to put all three pieces of, of FR4 together, to produce the board and then just drilling through all four, what you have to do is you have to drill this one first, then drill this one, sandwich them, and then drill through all four and make sure everything lines up. So it does incur a considerable manufacturing cost to do blind or buried vias. So if you can avoid it, just stick to the one through hole via. Okay? This is going to be your cheapest option. Now, another type of via we haven't covered is buried. And buried vias are ones that stay only internal to the board. They don't pop out on either surface. So something like this, by putting in parentheses, you'll see that we now have a buried via that connects layer 2 to layer 15. So what's the purpose? What's the idea of being able to do blind and buried vias if with just having the normal through hole via? we can reach all the layers. Well, in really, really tight layouts where real estate is at a premium, you actually save area on your surfaces by using blind and buried vias. Because now it's, in, it's a space that isn't taken up by a hole. You can place a component there. You can run a trace there. So in really, really space-constrained board designs where there's maybe a, a high number of components, Blind and buried vias are the only way to get those layouts done. But again, like I mentioned, they incur an additional cost. So keep that in mind when you're setting these up. Make sure your board house can do it. Because there's no point in having a layer stack up that the board house can't manufacture. OK? So again, if there's any questions about any of this, feel free, guys, to send them in at any point. Um, if I see them, then I'll, I'll be answering them in that moment.
If not, then, then no worries. I'll, I'll do it at the end. Hey, everyone is in. Excellent. So let's go to the next one. Hey, these, this is the clearances tab. The clearances tab defines minimum separations. Okay, I really want to uh, define that again. Okay, minimum separations. So you can have greater separation than this, and Eagle will be happy. What you're not allowed to have is something lower. So if you have two wires and they're less, in this case, than 8 mils, they're closer than 8 mils apart, Eagle will flag a DRC error. If they're more than 8 mils, it's okay. You're only defining minimums. And in most of the DRC parameters, that's what you're defining, a minimum. So keep that in mind. So here we have what is basically a triangular matrix of different clearances between wires, between wire and pad. Again, you can see very obvious what separation it's defining between wire and a via, between pads, between pads and vias, vias between vias. And then here we have same signal separations. How close can items of the same signals be, be applied? And you'll see there's some other configurations, uh, configurations here. Same signals check does not apply to micro vias. The same signals check also does not apply if they're within the same package. Okay. If you set it to zero, if you set any any setting within the DRC to zero, you basically disable the check. Okay. So normally this tab is very easy because the board house doesn't specify clearances as precise like this. They'll usually just say, our minimum clearance is five mils or six mils. And then what you'll do is you just set everything to be the same. So the default design rules is very conservative so that anyone can make the board without errors. But when you see, when you use a default DRC, just keep in mind that you can probably have a tighter layout that your board house will likely be able to do better because we, set up the default DRC to be conservative on purpose to avoid any issues, making sure all board houses can handle it. Okay. I did get a request to just very quickly review the layers thing. Um, remember, when you're setting up layers, you just want to go from the outside surfaces in. Okay. You always want to go from the outside surfaces in. 1, 16, 2, 15, 3, 14, like that. Don't go 1, 2, 3, 4, Go outside surfaces in. You're always going to go in pairs. Board houses, unless you really, really want them to, but they're going to charge you the same as a as, a, as an even number. Um, so board houses will do two, four, six, eight, because whenever you build up the board, you're always, you know, growing in even numbers. It doesn't really make sense to have a three-layer board or something like that. So always you're going to go in even numbers: four layers, six layers, eight layers, ten layers. It's, I've never seen a three or a five or a seven layer board. It just, from a manufacturing standpoint, it's not, it doesn't make sense to do that. So we're going to go now. If there's any, again, any questions, any point, feel free to send them in. Distance tab. This one's also a fairly simple tab. Okay, this tab, this parameter controls how close copper can get to a dimension line. In Eagle, lines drawn on dimension layer define the board outline. They define cutouts within the board. So usually I'll interpret this check as basically just how close copper can be to the edge of the board. Doesn't necessarily have to be correct, that interpretation, but 99% of the time it works. Um, the official definition is the distance between copper and any objects on the dimension layer. 40 mils is very large. Again, most board houses can do 15 to 20 without any issue. Drill and hole is basically how close two holes can be, how close two drills can be. Very straightforward. Nothing nothing too difficult there. Sizes tab. This one is important. Okay. You'll notice that this defines the minimum trace width in your design to be 10 mils. Again, very conservative. Most board houses will do six without an issue. Okay. So this defines your minimum width for the whole design. You can have width larger than this, and Eagle will still be happy. This is just defining a minimum. I emphasize that because sometimes users get the idea 
that you're setting up a specific size with this and you're not. You're defining a minimum. When the auto router runs, if there are no net classes defined, this is what it's going to use to route your board, okay? The mill here, and it's good to clarify, mills are thousandths of an inch. Millimeters are clearly designated as mm for millimeters. Mills are thousandths of an inch. We use that unit very, very commonly in, in PCB design. So minimum width, minimum drill is basically the minimum hole size of a pad or via. 24 mils is very large. Again, most board houses can do 15, 16, eyes closed. Microvia. Microvia is a little bit involved, but for this parameter, I can give you a basic idea behind it. Microvias are used on really high density parts such as BGAs, where you actually create a V on the pad itself. They're very, very small. They usually tend to be on the order of two mils, two to four mils, and they're very expensive. They're usually created using either a really, really fine bit, which is fragile as all heck, or a laser. Okay, so they will increase the cost of your board considerably. So you don't want to get into that unless you, you're sure you need it. If you have a high pin count BGA, you're probably going to need it. So keep that in mind. Microvias are disabled if the, this value here is larger than minimum drill. 9.99 .9 millimeters is close to a half inch, which is much, much larger than 24 thousandths of an inch. So this disables the check. The minimum blind via ratio, as you can see here, is basically the ratio of the thickness of the layer, basically the, how, the length of the, of the microvia to its diameter. The board house that does it will specify what that ratio is going to be. If they specify it, then you will want to go over here and specify these values. That way the check can be accurate. Okay, but again, that's an advanced use case for you guys. You don't really have to worry about it. Just know that you want to make sure that this value here is larger than this value. Okay? Go to the next tab. This is the restring tab. From the German tab translation, it probably should read rest ring. Okay? And what it controls is the annular ring the thickness of the annular ring, as you can see here, on your vias. The inner layer restring, bottom restring, for vias, inner and outer, micro vias. Okay, so you can see, again, the picture changes when in doubt on what a value controls, just change it. Now, this is likely the least understood parameter in the, in the design rules and the one that creates the most issues for our users. So I'm going to spend some time talking about this parameter. Okay, The goal of this parameter is actually quite noble. But if you're not aware of what it's doing, it can be super, super confusing. So let's say that in the library you define a, a pad with a certain drill value Okay, for the hole and a specific diameter, let's say a thin diameter, because that part has very tightly spaced holes or needs to, to have some other mounting requirement. And then you bring the part into the board and you look at it and something looks off. It looks like it has a really, really, really thick annular ring. Like this little green part has been inflated. And that tends to create a huge amount of confusion for our users because they, they, they look at it and they're like, well, I defined it one way in the library. Why is it different in the board? The reason it's different is this feature here, restring. Okay? This feature is always in play. There's no way to disable it um, under normal circumstances. There's no way to, 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 to basically void it. Um, you could set it to zeros, and but then you would have to make sure you always specify diameters. And what it does is as follows, or what its purpose is as follows. If we look at this via right here, I'm going to move this over a little bit. Just take a look at this. You'll notice that the hole is perfectly in the center, right? Perfectly in the center. That's the ideal scenario. And you would expect on a real board, 
for the Druid to be centered, right? The reality is that 90% of the time they're not centered. There is some tolerance here, some wiggle room here. And if they miss by a large enough amount and this hole breaks this, this outer diameter, then it ruins the pad and you lose connectivity on that via. So it's a big issue. It's a very, very important issue to make sure that you have enough thickness here, enough green, that even if they miss, the pad doesn't break. Because if the pad breaks, that connection breaks, and you have a non-functioning board. So that's the objective of this feature, to always guarantee that there's enough thickness here that even if the board house misses, or, or, or you know, taking into account the, the tolerance of the drill, that the pad will still be functional and it will still be okay. And again, board houses will specify what their what their minimum thickness for the annular ring is. They will give it to you if you ask them and you can find it in their manufacturing parameters. Okay? The default, like I said, like every other default in Eagles DRC is very conservative, so it will make large annular rings to basically guarantee that there isn't any issue. When you speak to your board house and they give you your specific parameter, you'll want to adjust it. Now, the way this one works, you'll notice that this parameter has a minimum, has a maximum, and it has a percentage. So the way restring works is as follows. Let's say, let's say we have a, a drill value of 10, just for the sake of argument, okay? First thing that will happen is it will be multiplied by this percentage. So you'll get 2.5. Eagle will then write 10 times 25% gives you 2.5, 2.5. Eagle will then compare that value to the minimum and the maximum. If it's within range, the value stays put. If it's outside of range, then Eagle will bump it to the range. So 2.5 less than the minimum 10 mils. Now Eagle will use the value of the minimum 10 mils. So the finished size, the overall diameter, is going to be the drill value, which is 10, plus two times this thickness, right? Because you have thickness on this side and thickness on this side. So the finished diameter is going to be 30 mils, as calculated here. If in the library you specified a diameter less than 30 mils, the restring will win, and the pad will come out larger. It will come out at the 30 mils. So the key to working with this is always making sure that if you have to define a diameter in the library, that your settings will win out because they're always competing with restring. The larger of the two will win. Okay? So that's what restring does, and that's how it works. If there's any questions, which I'm sure there will be about this, um, feel free to send them in. I'll answer them as, a, as I get them, or if not, at the end of the presentation. Next tab, shapes tab. This is a tab you won't really have to mess with much. Basically, it allows you to, on the board, globally adjust the, pad, the, the, the shapes of the pads. You can control the roundness, okay? If you have it set to zero, like is the case here, then you get rectangular pads. If you increase the roundness value, then you'll see that they'll start to curve. If the value is set to 100%, then it'll, they'll become circles. So normally, you won't want to tamper with that. Elongation, again, here, you can control how how long oval shapes become. You can see that controlled here. Again, won't have to tamper with it. Usually, you set it up in the library. Pads, you can control all the shapes globally, or you can just leave them as they are in the library. Most of the time, you'll want your component pads to stay with whatever is in the library. Same thing, you control the bottoms on the whole board. And if you have parts in which you defined a, a certain pin to be first, you can control that here. Okay, It's an additional uh, variable that you can tweak, but like I said, in this tab, most of the time you won't be tampering with anything here. The supply tab. The supply tab controls the thickness of the isolation. When the when the polygons connect to a pad, okay? So you can control that globally for the whole board here. It basically defines 
when you when you have a thermal connection, which is with the spokes on the pad, it defines how close the polygon is going to be to the overall pad, the thickness of that separation. The larger the thickness, the more heat can build up in the connection, the better the joint will solder. If you have a very thin clearance and just by, by heat conduction, the polygon will start to suck heat away from the polygon. So it's not it's not too critical. Um, you just want to make sure that you don't have a really, really small value here. The default value is OK. This checkbox is important. It basically allows you to create thermal connections for your vias. Most of the time, that's not desired because vias are just used to transition between layers, so you're not intending to solder to them. But some people, there may be a situation where that, that may come in handy. So again, we've allowed for that option here as well. Next, we have the mass tab. This one is also an important tab, OK? So this tab basically controls the expansion of the stop mask and of the cream mask. In the case of the stop mask, <coughs> it controls how much, how far beyond the the edge of the pad you want the stop mask to open. It's good to always have a little bit of, of extra expansion. That way there's no chance of the stop mask covering copper. So you always want to have a little bit of an expansion. This isn't the default setup. The default setup is basically four mils. So they set the minimum to four and the maximum to four. If you set minimum and maximum to four, then you're basically setting a global variable for the for, for the expansion. So the default DRC sets that to maximum, uh, to four mils for everything. The cream is used for stencil opening. So this applies to surface mount pads. And if you've ever seen the manufacturer of a surface mount board, Whenever solder paste needs to apply, to be applied, usually they want the stop mask opening to be a little bit smaller than the pad. So whatever value you enter here, it actually cuts back into the pad. It's not beyond the pad, but rather less than the pad. And this is common, because as soon as a part gets placed, it'll put pressure on the solder paste, and the solder paste is going to spread a little. So it's good to have a smaller opening. That way you don't get solder paste past the pad itself. Limit. This is a very useful parameter. So what limit does is any vias or any any pads larger, okay, larger than they have a drill value larger than whatever specified a limit, those stay as exposed copper. Anything smaller than the limit value will be covered. This is a process known as tenting. Okay? And it's useful when you have a high density board again and you don't want all these vias to be exposed because they're a shorting hazard. So by making the via slightly smaller than the rest of the design, you can have them tented. You can have them co covered with stop masks and that way the copper isn't exposed. By default the limit is set to zero which makes everything exposed. So this comes in handy, especially in small boards where you want to avoid shorting hazards. This does come in very handy. The final tab is the miscellaneous tab. And there's a lot of parameters here that are a little bit outdated that you don't really have to worry too much about. For example, check grid. Make sure that items are all on grid. Not really important these days. When there was only through-hole parts, that was useful. But now where you have through-hole pad, through hole parts and surface mount parts, all with different uh, pin pitches, you know, that, that check isn't really helpful anymore. The check angle can be handy sometimes if, you're, if you really need to make sure that all of your traces are sticking to 45 degree angles or, or multiple of it. Then the check angle check can be useful. The reason you, we recommend, or, or you'll find that many techs recommend sticking to 45 degree angles or multiple of 45 degree angles is that they minimize impedance changes along a trace. And they, they help in the manufacturing process. They help to avoid over etching and, and accumulation. They're subtle manufacturing issues, but if you have high volume products, they can actually make a difference. Check font, just make sure that all the fonts on the board are being used as vector or shown as vector. 
And then the restrict basically checks for any any violations of copper in the restrict areas, which is an important check. These two parameters are actually relatively new. They came in with the ability of Eagle to do differential pairs. So the first parameter basically checks the first parameter checks the tolerance or defines the tolerance of 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 a differential pair. So basically if the difference in length between two 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 traces of a differential pair is less than ten millimeters, then that's okay. We consider that a hundred percent same length. We consider that okay. It's within tolerance. Ten millimeters is actually very big, especially if you're doing anything with USB uh, any of the USB technologies or Ethernet, you know, 10 millimeters is way too big. You would want to go maybe two or five, you know, at the most. But again, whatever technology you work with will dictate what that tolerance is, and you can specify it here. The gap factor is actually kind of interesting. It, it basically controls the distance between loops in the meander. So the lower the gap factor, the closer the loops can be. So if, you, if you're trying to use the meander command to equalize your differential pair and you're just noticing this, making these really large loops, then going here to the gap factor and lowering that, you'll, it'll make smaller loops that are tighter, giving you more control over the length. Okay? So that basically covers all the parameters that we wanted to cover today in the, in the DRC. Now we're going to go ahead and, and take questions. So I'm going to go... Back to the questions here. Okay, so a couple of questions here. Let's take a look. So stop mask, is that the space between the via and the copper? No. Stop mask is the green stuff that they place on the board to avoid uh, solder traveling between pads. So if you have if you have a very, very, uh, something like a QFN part, or you know one of those surface mount parts that has the leads close together, you'll notice that they usually recommend to leave a little sliver. Okay, that way you still have stop mass between the two, uh, to leave a little, a little spacing, a little space in the stop mass between them, that way there's stop mass that avoids solder jumping between the pads. So stop mass is the green stuff that basically is placed on the board and avoids solder being able to move around and jump between pa uh, pads when you're soldering. It also avoids shorting hazards by covering the copper with a non-conductive layer. Okay. So another question here is, seems like lots of boards are going to gentle curved corners, not 45 degrees. Notice so I want to make sure I understand this question correctly. If we look at, let me show, share my screen again. If we look here, all of these corners are gentle. Okay, what I'm referring to is the bends in the trace itself being 45s or some multiple of it. Even 90s these days are discouraged because the hypotenuse there at the corner is about one and a half times the thickness of the trace. So there's a big impedance change there. Um, something like an Arduino or, or a low speed board, yeah, it's, it really doesn't make a difference. But once you're getting into more critical designs, that becomes an issue. Curved traces in some applications are useful, um, but these are just rules of thumb. These are just general rules of thumb that, that come up. Okay. Um, board houses seem to use the term paste, while legal uses the term cream. It's semantics, uh, you know. Depending on the board house, they may use some other name for it. So solder paste, solder cream. You know, we're, it, it's a big world we live in. Everybody will kind of use a different sort of term. So I, I just want to make sure users understand that when Eagle talks about cream, it's the same as paste. And if you look at the etymology, it's kind of close. It's kind of in, in the neighborhood. Um, let's hear some other questions. Okay. How does 
So first thing, someone asked me to quickly review the parentheses on blind vias one more time. So let me go ahead and do that. I don't see anything else in the chat for now, so I'll go through the Q&A. So going back to the DRC here, sharing my screen again. OK, parentheses between layers define a via be connecting those two layers. That's why you see a big parentheses here between 1 and 16. Okay. If I put a parentheses on it between any of the internal layers, you'll, I'll have a blind via going, uh, a buried via going between them. If I had more layers, let's say a six-layer board times three plus fourteen times fifteen, let's say something like that. Okay. Then I could do something like have a buried via between. Uh, you know, I cover three layers, for example. I could do something like this. Okay. So, buried via that goes between 3 and 15. Doesn't exit out either side. I could do it just on two of them. When you're defining blind vias, that's when you use the square brackets. You know, a number in the front, colon, and then colon number in the back, square brackets. Okay, you don't always have to define both sides. I can just have it like that, you know. So that's how it works. Again, these are more advanced usage scenarios. If you do run into issues with those, you can see chapter 6.5 of the Eagle Manual. It gives you some ideas as to how you might set this up. Also, if you're in the control panel, uh, let me cancel this. If you go to the documentation tree in the Eagle uh, control panel, you'll see this document here, Layer Setup Design Rules. And it gives you some tips and some example configurations, which I'll pop up now. See? So it gives you some ideas of how you, how you might set something like this up. and some example configurations and things like that. So it's, the document is worth checking out. You'll see that it starts doing, starts getting a little fancy on some of these. But, uh, but check it out. If you guys have any questions, you can feel free to contact us. Okay. How does the DRC know that two traces are a differential pair? The way it knows is by the name. Basically, we have a rule that if to define a differential pair, you, the, the two nets have to have certain specific uh, format in their name. So for example, let's say in the case of the USB, what you would end up doing is you would type USB underscore N for one of them. The other one would be USB underscore P. The N and the P are special. The, the underscore P and the underscore N, Eagle treats as special, and that defines it as a differential pair. The portion prior to the underscore must be identical for both nets. So you can't have USB plus underscore P and USB minus underscore N. That's not allowed. It has to be USB underscore P, USB underscore N. That's how Eagle recognizes a differential pair. Okay, let me see. Any other questions? Okay, I got a, a question here about Martin. Some time ago, about I read about Gerber 2x. I think you mean X2, Gerber X2. It does include the. Well, I don't know if the Gerber, if that new format will carry that information. If you read over the standard, what it carries is actually very minute. It doesn't really add that much to the Gerber standard. We do have plans to support it in the future but we don't have a, a timetable right now for it. So we, we do have, have plans to support it at a future date, but right now we have the NETA on it. Okay. It should, should be called Gerber X2. It's owned by a company called Umamco, if memory serves. Okay, we have a question. Could I manually draw in a circuit board drawing 
directly into the board layout. I think you're trying, you're referring to maybe like taking a picture of the board, like a physical board, and then trying to trace over it. That would be tricky. That would not be an easy thing to do. That it's possible to do, yeah, you probably could do it, but it's going to be a lot of work and it can't guarantee, you know, it would be hard to guarantee that it would be an accurate representation. I mean, you would have to scale it right. You would have to probably clean up some of the picture. Um, yeah, I mean, you could draw it. You could just use the wire command and pads and bring in parts and manually redraw it. You could do that as well. But it, it, usually the, the, the preferred approach is schematics and board. That way you have documentation. So six months down the road, when you've forgotten about everything you've done on this board, you have a, a way to, to get your work done, you know, and to be able to, to review it and make changes. Okay, any other questions, guys? Are the previous recordings that you've done for previous topics available for viewing? Yes, they are. They are up on our YouTube channel. Let me show you guys where it's at. It's actually getting kind of nice. It's been organized. and So let me go over there. This is our YouTube channel. Okay www.youtube.com user eagle cad soft computer okay this is our youtube channel if you go into the playlist you'll find eagle webinars first flights the previous five episodes are here okay and this one uh shortly after the recording becomes available will also be here as well okay so check out our youtube channel feel free all the you know, check out the various uh, sessions. The First Flights is under its own playlist. Advanced Eagle is under its own playlist. We have the guided tour videos, which are being updated. We have the PCB Sim guided tour videos. And we have webinars that we've done for projects. Um, the compressor pedal, simulation, building components, talking with a pro, which is a new series we're doing as well. So... A lot of good content here, a lot of stuff covered in Eagle. So recommend you guys check it out. Okay, anything else guys? Any other questions? Um, Guy, the question you're you're mentioning, uh, we can do that in a separate um, situation. If you look at the first slides, the first few episodes, you'll get an idea of how that works. Um, but that's outside the scope of this of this webinar. Um, got a question from Samuel with a 0 0.65 BGA. Do you recommend a trace width? Go with whatever the manufacturer recommends. That would be my my suggestion. Um, definitely going to have something small there, probably in the four to five mil range. It's going to be expensive, but if you're using a BGA, you probably knew that already. <laughs> so it's probably going to be in the four to five mil range. Mike, uh, why have a thermal on a via? The only thing I can think of is sometimes users place via the later solder wires to. So just having the option is handy, and it probably wasn't a lot of effort on the developer side to do that. So it was added in. That would be my guess. But most of the time, I do not encourage that. Won't hurt anything. Won't do any damage. But um, I think for vias, especially if they're under a thermal pad, you're going to want them to be a solid connection. Okay, any other questions? Okay, guys, if there are no other questions, I thank you for everything. Thank you for, for being here. This recording will be available soon. And feel free to to, to email me, support at cadsoftusa.com if you guys have any other questions. Thank you for your attention. Remember, we're going to be having a PCB SIM webinar this Thursday. 
we're going to be covering gallium nitride devices and simulating them. So if that's something you guys do, it should be pretty interesting. Take care, guys, okay? Have a great day. Bye, everyone.